We will be looking at uh, sustainable future and to discuss some of these uh, important themes, I have with me the CEO of Syngenta, Eric Firwold. Thank you so much for joining me here today. Great to be with you, Sylvia. And you're also one of the members of the CNBC ESG Council. And yes. of course, this has been going on for a year now. I would like to get your thoughts on the progress that you've done so far. And of course, right now, there are a lot of challenges out there. Yeah. There's the Russia invasion of Ukraine. We're seeing a lot of issues over food supply chains. Is essentially this new world, though, we're living in, just making it very complicated to be more, essentially, better with our ESG targets? Well, I think what's important is to, to, to consider what, what's the real challenges, the critical challenges facing the world. And to me, it's, it's a combination of, of now food crisis, which before was a food security concern, now a few, food crisis, and climate change. And we have to address both crises together. And agriculture plays a critical role, not only obviously in food security, but also in dealing with climate change. Today, agriculture is 12% of greenhouse gas emissions, a, a third when you consider the whole ag food chain. We have to take that to positive, nature positive, to, to, to capture carbon in the soil while we address the food security crisis, enable enough food for everybody on the planet, and have agriculture be part of the solution to climate change. Actually, I, I made this quite public in uh, a couple of days before arriving in Davos. I said that one of the main themes that I'm interested to know more about is indeed what's going on over food supply shortages and yeah. indeed that this food crisis that we're witnessing at the moment. What have been some of the discussions that you've had here in Davos? Do you feel that there's indeed more discussion about how to take action in, yes. in this regard? Yeah, for, first of all, it, there's been much better understanding of the situation. So when you think about it, we already had a food security challenge, a huge challenge because of climate change. Just think of, of, of all the weather extremes that are happening now that make farming more difficult. Recently, 49 degrees in India, which bakes crops. Increasing droughts, the Western United States, huge drought problem, the worst in history. Drought problems in parts of Latin America, flooding in China, I mean, massive weather extremes that make farming much more difficult. So you start with that, 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 makes, that, that makes a food security challenge. Then you put on top of that COVID with incredible supply chain challenges. And then comes cl cl conflict. Ukraine feeds 400 million people around the world. So food prices were already coming up. Now with the conflict, wheat prices are up 53% this year. So if it, what we have to do is, specifically in Ukraine, uh, we're, we have to help farmers plant a crop again this year, which Syngenta Group and others are out there bravely helping farmers do. But we also have to help get grain out of Ukraine. And the EU is helping do that by land, but less than 20% of the grain can come out by land, even at the best estimates. So we have to free up ports out of Odessa and south for humanitarian reasons. So that's one thing that has to be done. The other thing is we have to, and we're talking a lot about this with farmer groups and with government officials, we have to help farmers grow more on less land so we keep land in nature or return more land to nature and do it in a way that reduces greenhouse gas emissions. Is this just about to get even worse? Because we don't see the conflict in, uh, in Ukraine getting uh, any better anytime soon. Yes, David Beasley, the head of the World Food Program, and by the way, the World Food Program feeds 125 million people, has stated at, at, at um, Davos that there are close to 400 million people that are nearing starvation. And this could well push them over toward, to, to starvation and more beyond that, which of course causes all kinds of challenges. It causes horrific humanitarian suffering but also it ca causes emigration. People will leave the countries affected in, in Middle East and Africa and parts of Asia. Uh, it will cause conflict, government overthrows. Recently in Sri Lanka, uh, Sri Lanka went to all organic. The yields dropped by 50%. The government's now been overthrown. I mean, these, these kinds of things can be avoided and we must avoid them. 
I'm actually quite happy you mentioned that because we've seen several countries taking several measures to essentially stop exports of key products. Yeah. For instance, India when it comes to wheat, Indonesia, palm oil. Are we essentially just seeing a new wave of protec protectionism that is going to make food prices even higher? Yes, we, we are, unfortunately. But I think one of the benefits of Davos is, is bringing people together from all over the world, including those countries, to talk about the importance of, of keeping trade flows open. That's the only way we keep feeding everybody. And, and countries that, that are, are short of, of food today will need food from other countries. And, and so we've got to keep those trade flows open. And I think, I think those discussions are, are, are getting through. And I think the United Nations and, 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 and Davos can, can be influencing to make that happen, to keep, keep, keep the borders open. Let's see what's going to happen on that front. But I know that Brazil, for instance, is one of your key markets. And yes. in Brazil, some of the images we've seen are definitely pointing to a lot of deforestation. What can be done, in particular in Brazil, in order to make sure that the country takes the right path in terms of ensuring that uh, deforestation does not play, take place and at the same time the farmers get the profits that they need? Well, two, two things that we're doing. I'm actually going to Brazil next week. We have an event every year called One Agro, and we bring 1,500 farmers from all across Brazil that represent about 60% of Brazil farming. And this year, the focus is going to be on regenerative agriculture practices. And we'll be explaining and, and, and supporting the farmers to adopt regenerative agriculture practices such as no tilling to leave the carbon in the soil, after, they, after you, you harvest a crop, you put a cover crop so that the, the soil is always covered so that there's less erosion and there's more carbon going into the soil and rotating crops so it's, it's healthier soil. And by doing that, you increase the yield with the healthier soil and you dramatically reduce the greenhouse gas emissions and you reduce the pesticide and fertilizer needed. We have 1,600 demonstration farms around the world using these regenerative agriculture techniques where we've seen dramatic increases in yield and reduction in greenhouse gas emissions and redu reduced pesticide and fertilizer. So that's one area, is, is, is get farmers around the world, including Brazil, to adopt better practices. The other area that we're doing in Brazil is we've got a major project called Reverte. And it's together, Syngenta Group, together with the Nature Conservancy, a, a global NGO, uh, Embrapa, the, the Brazilian research, agriculture research organization, and Itaú Bank today. And we're bringing in more partners to help address the, the de degraded pasture land. So instead of deforestation, let's take the 40 million hectares of degraded pasture land that are sitting there doing very little and, 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 and adopt practices, regenerative practices, to bring that soil back to health and productivity for growing soybeans, corns, grains, and, and, and pasture land for cattle. So that is an alternative to deforestation is something that I'm, we, we are absolutely passionate about making happen. And of course, a lot has to do with uh, education and sharing best practices. But I know that another of your ESG targets is essentially to come up with two, two technology uh, breakthroughs every year. Yes. Could you give us an update on where you are at the moment? Yeah, it's, it's going very well. And so one, one example is this Reverte project in Brazil to, to reclaim degraded pasture land. Another one is called Runtian, and we're doing it in, in China and India and other countries where we're getting farmers to stop burning their fields. So what, what's been happening is farmers, after they harvest their crop, like a rice farmer in, in, in China, will harvest their crop and then they'll burn the crop in order to plant the next crop. Well, instead of burning the crop, we provide them products that enable them to keep the, the residue on the field and then plant over it. So, th so the carbon stays in the ground, which is actually healthy for the soil, and then they plant through it and then and the next crop comes up without any burning. So you don't get the environmental disaster of the burning or the, the loss of the carbon into the, the CO2 into the atmosphere. So those are example projects of where we're bringing practices and technologies that enable farmers to do these things. I would like to get your thoughts more broadly on ESG as a, an option for investors because quite recently Elon Musk did have this quote that essentially ESG is a scam. 
Um, do you agree with his comment? No, not at all. I, I think that ESG has gone from something people talked a little bit about five years ago and people are saying, what, is, what does it even stand for, to something that's, that, that's at the heart of companies like Syngenta Group and many, many others where you, you have to have a purpose. <laughs> And, and that purpose has to resonate so you get great employees and you attract investors and, and collaboration partners. So our purpose at Syngenta is, to, is to, to bring the capabilities to serve farmers all over the world to make sure there's always enough food for everyone, healthy, safe, affordable food for consumers, but also that agriculture is part of the solution to climate change, that we head from 12% of greenhouse gas emissions to carbon neutral. But he does have a point in the sense that the criteria is not very clear. Well, I think every company needs to, to, to decide on its own what are the, what's their mission and, and then demonstrate through data what they're doing to achieve that mission. So if you're saying that we're going to be carbon neutral by a certain date, what are your plans and what's the data that shows you doing this? And I'll give you an example of how this accelerates growth if you, if you do it in the right way. Mm -hmm. In China, we've got a new business that we formed four years ago called MAP, or Modern Agriculture Platform. What we did was we, we created farmer solution centers across China. We now have 550 MAP centers. And those MAP centers teach farmers how to adopt the best regenerative practices, provide them the best technology, the products, and the digital tools to grow a great crop. But not only do we help the farmers grow a great crop, but we connect that crop all the way to consumers. So we recently developed some really great tasting tomatoes called uh, Nebula and, and Yum, two, two tomatoes, one sweet and one umami flavor. Package them in Disney character package and then sell, sell them to consumers. Well, on the package is a map beside brand, which stands for sustainably high quality grown, but also a QR code. The consumer in China scans the QR code, sees a picture of the farmer that grew their tomatoes or strawberries, and sees the sustainability data. How much lower greenhouse gas emissions, how much less pesticide, fertilizer, and, and, and that draws consumers. Consumers want to buy things that taste great, that are healthy, but they also want to know that it's sustainably grown. Should therefore governments be implementing some sort of legislation that would essentially force every single product that we buy in the supermarket, whether that's tomatoes, chips, whatever, that says exactly carbon footprint is this essentially a sustainability tag on the product? I think that there should be standards about how to do that, and governments should, should ensure that they're in place, and I think consumers should drive that. I think consumers should demand it. They should demand to understand products that they buy, what the carbon footprint is, and allow them to choose sustainable products because that will drive the, the, the farmers and the supply chains in all industries to, to provide those products that are sustainably developed or grown. Going back to your business, um, could you just let us know what sort of plans you have for Russia, whether you're planning on scaling back any sort of business there given the invasion of Ukraine? Yeah, let, let me step back and say that we, we've got a food security crisis that's causing people to die of starvation. And Syngenta Group is absolutely committed. Our mission is to serve farmers everywhere in the world, nothing political about it, to serve farmers everywhere in the world so that people don't starve. So because of that, we will continue to serve farmers in Ukraine. Our people are bravely going out in the fields today and, and helping farmers sow the seeds for the next crop, but also in Russia and every other country to make sure that farmers grow food so that people don't starve in Africa, the Middle East, Asia, anywhere in the world. So would you say that Russia also has to play a role here in essentially making better the situation over, over the food crisis? There's more than 400 million people that get fed by Russian farmers. Uh, we cannot allow this food security crisis to cause more people to starve than necessary. The problem is that the government, the President Putin, do not seem to care about that. Well, the Russian farmers continue to grow crops, and those crops continue to, despite challenges, get to world markets, and we need that to continue to happen, and we need the Ukraine grain flows to come out more.
Let me just get your final thoughts on uh, supply chains, because this is also one of the big discussions here at Davos. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of concern, in a way, about shifting supply chains back to the West. That will drive inflation higher, even higher. Um, what do you have to say about the discussions that you've had here in Davos? And is this something that you're also concerned about? I'm absolutely concerned about it, but I think in agriculture, governments, companies, farmers, consumers, retailers, food companies are all realizing that for agriculture, it's a special situation, that the world has to collaborate to make sure that everybody has enough food. And we have to collaborate with, with open trade flows. We have to collaborate with technology. There's lots of new startups coming up with new ideas on how to increase food security. And, and do it in a way that's climate friendly. We have to, we have to support that and enable that. And, and very importantly, $700 billion a year goes to agriculture subsidies. Those subsidies need to be repurposed to encourage regenerative agriculture so that there's enough food for everybody and we deal with climate change. That's what I was going to ask you, because for instance, if you look at Europe, there's a big chunk of European funds that go into agriculture. Are those actually being used in the right, uh, in the right way? I think they can be used better. And I think Macron, President Macron recently saying that we need a fresh look at the farm to fork strategy because it doesn't have outcome goals. It needs outcome goals of, of productivity from farming and greenhouse gas emission reductions from farming, for example. With those outcome goals, then the EU will, will look at how to help farmers do that. We can help farmers have additional tools, additional practices like regenerative agriculture to make that happen. So I think this is a really important time to understand the severity of the crisis and have governments, including the EU, take real actions now. And that's, that's what's been discussed here at Davos, but we need to turn it into real actions out there, helping farmers grow more. Time is of essence here. Exactly. Thank you so much for your time this morning. It was a pleasure speaking with you. And thank you all for joining our conversation. I hope you've enjoyed this discussion on our sustainable future.